Now you're going to have to excuse me just for a moment. It is absolutely gorgeous down here. The sun is out. It looks tremendous. The only problem is <clears throat> the only place that I've got to set up this computer is staring straight into a window. So even though the wind, the sun is out, that just means that I can't see anything. Do you not have snow? Uh, no, we don't. We have that. Snow. Well, it's you, nice and sunny, but we've got snow. Yeah. It was like yesterday, it was, um, it was really cold. Sunny, but really cold, and there was some snowflakes. I don't know if you can just see it in the background, but you can. There's snow in the hills of Iron back there. I don't know if you can see it on that horrible wee camera that I've got facing out my window. Kind of have to do. Okay. So now that on this beautiful sunny day that we don't normally get, I've had to close my curtains. We can get started. Does anybody have any questions from last week? You don't have a sample report just for the structure and layout, do you? Because I had to look online and can't find anything. Not the content, obviously, but feel free if you want to add the content. And it's just <laughs> I basically everything I searched, it was companies offering to make one for a company, but no samples. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. What I tend to find is if I give a sample, what I get in at the end of uh, the term is a whole bunch of reports that look exactly like the sample. And I'm really keen that you actually use your own professional judgment on how this should, should work, how it should look, how it should be, rather than just saying, oh, well, that was in the sample that Tony showed us, therefore that's the only way it can be. Um, if you work on me over the weeks, I might show you some previous year's ones, but that, that's the reasoning why it's not there. Cool. I just don't know the layout. That's my struggle. OK, I'll, I'll maybe look out one for next week and let you see just an idea. But if you look at the, um, the assessment itself and it asks you what's in there, so it talks about uh, the first bit, which is the executive summary, what you're actually telling them. And then it talks about having, I talk about it in different ways at different times, but sometimes I talk about it as a bunch of appendices or sections or add-ons. And each of those, in essence, um, corresponds to one of the sections on the middle. So, Whatever you've told them to set up on the basis of their um, organisation, you'll probably want to say, oh, well, you should set up governance like this. So that's what you're telling them to do. But if they then want to understand more about it, you'll have a section in your report that's pro properly referenced and has all the kind of academic stuff that you need to do, but also gives them all the background about why you've made that recommendation. So you'll ha probably have a section called governance and a section called risk and a section called uh, industry frameworks and a section called legislation. Does that make sense? No, I hope it will as the weeks go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't actually covered any of the material yet, I suppose. So hopefully it will. Any other questions just now? Nope. Neil, it's good to see you've got your IT issues sorted. 
Good to see you here next week. Uh, this week, don't forget to look at last week's lecture though, because you missed all the stuff, so you probably have no idea what we're talking about right now. Unless, of course, you listen to what I said in the email and have watched it already. Neil? Yeah. Did you watch last week's? Yeah, I watched last week's lecture. Okay. Good. Okay, so there's no more questions. What we'll do is we'll start on this week's lecture. And like I said, we're basically just going to run through in order the stuff that's on Moodle. So it shouldn't be a, a surprise to see anything. So not surprisingly, first thing that's on Moodle is governance. And that's what we'll start with today. Genuinely, my computer is just so slow today. I don't know what its issue is. Okay, you all seeing that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, module is called Governance, Risk and Compliance. So, not surprisingly, um, we're starting off with governance. How many of you have uh, been in an organisation, worked somewhere, done anything? Me. I've Quick show of virtual there. hands. Couple of you. Five of you. Good. OK. So. For those of you that have worked in an organisation, you'll know that there are typically several layers. Um, if you work on a, a shop floor, you might have a supervisor who has a manager who has an executive. So there might be all these different layers in the organisation. And depending on where you are in the organisation will depend how many powers you have and what you're allowed to do and all that kind of stuff. That's not governance. That's management. That's how the organisation works on a day to day basis and who does what and when and who tells them to do that. Governance is different. It's more than just management. It's not just doing it on the day to day basis. It's ensuring that it's done for the best reasons. Now, best reasons itself is a is a movable feast. So if it's uh, a shop, best reasons might be uh, how are we going to make the most money? If it's a charity, it might be how can we help the most people? So best will be dependent on what the organisation is, what it's set up to do, what it's there for. So sometimes it will be a financial best but not always. So for example, in your um, case study, finance will have an interest because it's a, a, a oh, come on computer. It's going to be one of those days, isn't it? <sighs> I 
Is it just me? Is everyone else's machines running really slowly today? Is it because it's Monday morning and everyone's back at work or back at university? No, the schools are online. Yeah, that's true. So, your case study, now I've finally got there, is a community, develop, community development trust. Now, clearly, as a community development trust, its main focus is on developing the community. So, BEST, in its case, will include developing the community. But of course it can't do that unless it can continue its work. So it, it needs to be financially solvent. So finance will come into it. And if you think about it, it's the same with every charity. The Cats Protection League can't protect a cat if nobody donates to them to set up shelters and give them food and all that kind of stuff. So there's really one specific thing that you can point to as being this is the thing so there'll be a, a bunch of competing priorities. And part of governance is deciding which one wins. Um, Apple, Apple computers. Clearly their um, focus is on making money and they're very good at it. I bought uh, an Apple TV from them, bought it online and uh, after about two years it just refused to do anything and I did what everyone does, you go on Google, you follow all the instructions, you do all the hard resets and soft resets and blowing the firmware and all that kind of stuff, couldn't get the thing to work. I happened to be going to Brayhead, or I happened to be taking people to Brayhead without me having much choice in it, to be honest. You know, back in the days when we could still go out. And because I was going to be there, I thought, that's an Apple store, I'll take it in and see if they can do it and see what happens. So I took it in, and the guy behind the counter did everything that I had done, tried the firmware, tried the resets, couldn't get anything to happen, said, hang on there a wee second. And I watched him and he got out from behind his wee bar, walked over to a shelf, took down a, a box that had an Apple TV in it, came over, got out his keys, broke the cellophane, took out an Apple TV and said, there you go. And I was happy, but surprised because as I said the, the Apple TV was well out of warranty there was no reason that he had to do that but he decided well we can't fix it therefore you get a new one Apple's a company they look after the bottom line but somewhere at some point someone said well part of us having a good bottom line. Part of us having cash is customers who will buy from us. And not surprisingly, since they did that, they've kept a customer and made me want to use Apple again. So their choice is to be customer focused to try and bring customers back because they'll win in the long run. Because their actual loss on that Apple TV is probably very low. It's just whatever it costs them to manufacture. But the long term goal to keep a customer, to make, keep them coming back, to make me buy a new Mac that will feed that Apple TV or whatever it's going to be, is best served by having great customer service. And it worked. But there are two competing things. In the short term, they lost money, but in the long term, they hope to gain it. 
So it's good customer service, but more to the point, it's good governance. Because think what would have happened inside that Apple store. We've got the guy who works behind the, the desk, the genius bar, whatever they call it, on his own authority, wandered over, gave me a new Apple TV. He didn't check with his manager and his manor, manager didn't check with head office and they didn't make me fill out 500 forms. They got the Apple TV, they looked at the serial number, they saw that I'd bought it from them, <clears throat> excuse me, online via the website, and he just gave me the new, the new Apple TV. That's governance. They've decided how they want their company to run, and the people that work for them know what that decision is. So the guy behind the genius bar was able to just do that. He understood what would be acceptable and what wouldn't. He knew that he wasn't going to suddenly get shouted at by his manager for doing this. That's governance. Because they're trying to ensure that the organization works in the best interest of all stakeholders. And for a company, customers include are included in stakeholders. The people who worked in that Apple store knew what the governance structures were, how they wanted their company to work. They were transparent, they were accountable. So they had been told what was going to happen, they knew how it was going to work, and they had a set of principles that they were going to work to. Keep the customer happy if you can. And that does, doesn't just come from, you know, whoever's working in the Brayhead Apple store, that comes from the top. So it's about deciding what your core principles are and ensuring that everybody who works in the organization understands them and will use them. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So just as a wee aside, when I'm talking about these things, I'll talk about different types of organisations. Sometimes they're business, sometimes they're charities, sometimes they're community development trusts, sometimes they are governments or councils. It doesn't really matter. The principles apply everywhere. So if I accidentally say company or I accidentally say government or whatever it may happen to be, the principles stay the same. OK. I remember when I was telling you about the, the way we were set up and at the end of every um, section, there would be a quiz so that you could get a better idea of what to take out of it and that would help um, fill in your report. Yeah. Remember that? So there's a quiz there. And I don't know if you remember, but the first question in the quiz was, tell me about the uh, pyramid structure for organisations and how that helps in governance. So I won't do this every time, but here in the first lecture, as a slide exactly talking about that. OK, so all of these quiz questions that you'll see, there'll be stuff either in the lecture or in the the, um, the stuff that's on middle. So you get this kind of pyramid structure in every organisation. So a government sets a strategy. The government says, we want to inoculate the whole population. Well, that's great, but how do you do that? Well, underneath the government is a civil service management whose job it is to go out and buy vaccines, set up vaccination centres, train people to give the vaccine, a send out letters saying it's time. All of that kind of stuff needs organised. 
and then that will then be implemented. So in government circles, it's a government, then a civil service, and then civil servants. But the same things apply. So when that inoculation, that strategy works its way down, what we have in Scotland is something called an integrated joint board. It's what health boards are called these days. And it um, takes into account the idea that it's not just health boards that are involved in health, it's part of social services as well. If you can, for example, um, take someone out of hospital, put them back in their own house, but still provide them support, that's far cheaper, far effect, more effective and far better for the person than sitting in hospital for ages. So locally, wherever you are, assuming you're in Scotland, you'll have an integrated joint board, which sets a strategy and a direction for how in your area that vaccination is going to work. And that will be a joint thing. So there'll be a health board that will talk about um, how we train people to give vaccinations and how uh, vaccinations will be delivered and stored if we have this problem with keeping them cold. What they don't have are places to do it. But who does? Your local council. They've got community centres or town halls or civic centres or anything else. So there'll be a joint organisation for that to happen for councils and health boards. And then that will then go on and be implemented again. So we've got national government, we've got local government. And we've got companies or charities, but it's the same idea. It's a strategy or direction for that organisation. The management will organise it and then it will be implemented by operations people. So the name might change. It might be a government or an IJB or a board. There might be civil service or councils or management. There might be civil servants or operations, but that pyramid, the way things work, stays the same no matter what. Makes sense? Aye. Aye. OK, so. This idea that um, governance and management are two completely different things is so important that it's actually enshrined in some of those frameworks that we're talking about. So anybody that's that's read on a wee bit or anybody that was paying attention when we were talking about the assessment will remember I spoke about ITIL and COBIT. So here, for example, from COBIT is the, a video about separating governance from management. Okay, so every step of this thing, we actually try and separate separate out these things. So in the video, you saw it as enclosed boxes. Here it's shown by a pyramid, but it's the same kind of idea. One of the ways that organisations try and set that governance, set the tone for the organisation is to use a mission statement. They'll try and say what it is that they are trying to do in, in a pithy way. 
So does anyone recognise Dream, Believe, Achieve? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, the kind of slogan that you see all the time in UWS. Of course, there is another one. Their actual full mission statement is, as you see there, our purpose is to change lives, transform communities, and encourage enterprise through outstanding, distinctive, and progressive higher education. <gasps> our focus is on personalized learning experiences supported by internationally recognized research. <gasps> USW graduates will be work ready and contribute locally and globally. Do you have a preference? Probs a lot. <laughs> simple. Making a simple mission statement, but one that, that represents what it is you want to do, is it's actually quite hard. So to help make every brand more inspiring and the world more intelligent is the mission statement for Avery. And if you come across them, they make sticky labels. I mean, you know, God love them, 10 out of 10 for trying, but I've never been inspired by a sticky label in my life. Second one, our mission is to operate the best speciality retail business in America, regardless of the product we sell. And it goes on and on and on. To say that our mission exists independent of the product we sell is to demean the importance and the distinction of being booksellers. This is from a company called Barnes & Nobles who are booksellers. But the booksellers, regardless of the product they sell, so are they proud of being booksellers or not? I'm really confused with that. I really don't get it. We are booksellers and we're proud of selling books, but we want to sell different things from books because that will make us more money. But don't forget that we're booksellers because that's what we started with and we're proud of it. So we don't want our staff to be upset, but we do want to sell other things like t-shirts. What? MGM Resorts International, the leader in entertainment and hospitality, a diverse collection of extraordinary people, distinctive brands and best in class destinations. I don't have quite the deep voice that I think you would need for that, but uh, you would get on the ad there. We do hotels and casinos. That's, that's not a name, that's a statement. Aren't we wonderful? Look at us. Some organisations do it better. The Alzheimer's Association mission statement is a world without Alzheimer's disease. I can understand that. Uh, the Creative Commons, Australia Department of Health, better health and well-being for all Australians now and for future generations. It encapsulates what they're trying to do and it says where they want to be in the future. So, we have out of interaction. Three mission statements there. Anybody want to take a shot at which organisations those mission statements describe? Can you do it verbally or in the chat? No offence, Anthony, but I'm muting you because your music in the background is just irritating. Nobody want to make a guess at these mission statements? This is the second one on Amazon. Could be Amazon. Certainly match up to Amazon. Any others? I was going to say first one, Microsoft. Something like that. Yep, I can see where you're coming from, although I'm not sure that crowdsourced applies to me. Oh, crowdsourced, yeah. First one's is like Kickstarter or something. Mm. 
does look like Kickstarter. Problem is, of course, it could look like any one of a hundred companies, which is probably why they came from the mission statement generator online. That just you press a button and it goes away and generates a mission statement for you. It was a bit lazy. That's what it is. Microsoft. Oh. I had an update when I logged on this morning. And it's changed how Alt Tab works. It was thoroughly confusing me there. So that's what it's doing. It's showing me the windows that are open on each screen and asking me to click on them. Well, that's thoroughly confusing. A company exists to collaboratively, collaboratively utilize Agile Six Sigma programs. I'm sure that's a genuine one. Oh, doesn't every company want to collaboratively leverage innovative technology to reach new levels of customer service? I genuinely think a company's used that one with me. Assertively, that's a good one. We'll assertively manage it. Assertively and paradigms in the same mission statement. Whenever somebody's getting paid for coming up with a mission statement, I'm sure they just come to this website and just go for it. OK, so governance is about setting the tone for your organization. It's getting everyone to understand internally and externally what it's about, and that can be tough. So having a mission statement is helpful, but only if it actually um, corresponds to what it is you're wanting to do. More importantly, governance is about the framework of how you're going to run the organization. So what I think we'll do is we're about halfway through this set of slides. So I think what we'll do, assuming you're all amenable, is take a quick break. Because you've probably heard me chatting for long enough. How long would you like? Five, 10, 15? Sorry, Jackie, I heard you said something, but I couldn't make it out. That's my oh. voice, that was Justina. Yeah, <laughs> 15 minutes. 15. Okay, okay. 15 minutes it is. Oh man, everything's just so slow. Right, 15 minutes. I'll see you back here.
Welcome back. You have time to get a cup of tea? Just. <laughs> Me too. Surprising how long it takes to make a cup of tea, actually. I know. You'll be figuring that out now. <laughs> Then you get down, boil a kettle, wait for it. Oh, man. Anyway. See, I'm in the kitchen, so I'm all right. I'm right beside it. Oh, are you? That's cheating. That's why my <laughs> camera's off, so that everybody can come in and out. But that's the fun part. I had a dog and a cat on a, on a meeting the other day. It was great. My 16-year-old doesn't like it. <laughs> she hovers at the door waiting for me to turn everything off before she comes in. You tell to come in and say hello. Oh, well, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then the madness of the four year old starts shortly, so everything gets turned off. <laughs> Probably should add something to my tea. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you haven't already? <laughs> I've been doing it all long. Okay, I suppose we better, you know, work. <laughs> My no. cat must have heard you he's on my desk. He doesn't no. come up here to. He must send something. Somebody wants to see him. He's coming What's up. No, he's off. Gaffy. You need, need the rabbit up. No, it's at my feet. Oh, is it? <laughs> Give him your feet warm. It's a way to sleep now, but it was running around my feet a minute ago. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Okay, so, governance. Um, much like a lot of these things, um, a lot of governance comes down to communications. So how you govern, the, the aims of the governance that you're, that you're going to implement will come down to a whole bunch of I know it says rules on the, the slide, but practices is better. How you want things to happen. Things that are clear for everybody, things that they can refer to and understand how um, you want them to act. Not a, if this happens, do this. More in a, a, general, a, a general way. So it's not a complete list of everything that might happen, but it is a way you would expect people to, to um, to work depending on what's going on. It should include everybody that has an interest in the organisation. So that's internal and external. So anybody who's in the company, clearly, anybody who interacts with it, customers, anybody who finances it, anybody who's involved. And of course, for most organisations, that will include things like the government. Rules can change. Just ask all those organisations who suddenly have to fill out 47 sheets of paper to export a carton of carrots. And that is not, I wasn't making that up, by the way, that's what you have to do now. If you send a carton of carrots from the UK to France, you have to fill in 47 different forms. How you cope with something like that is very clearly a, a core part of governance for your organisation. So that's what you need to set up. You'll set up a, a governance framework. So it might be explicit. Um, we make it a rule that um, you treat each other with respect at all times. Or it could be implicit. Because of that, you know that running in and swearing isn't a, a good idea. Or swearing at the customers isn't a good idea. Or swearing at your colleagues isn't a good idea. So what your responsibilities are, what your rights are, how everything should work within your organisation and what to do 
if either what you're trying to do conflicts with each other or for something that you don't have. So if something that you just haven't thought about pops up, what do you do about it? So you need procedures to do all of these things. Now, like I said, that setup comes from the top. So you have your governance pyramid there. And it comes from the board or the IGB or the government or whatever it is you're actually setting up. But we'll just call it the board for simplicity. It's up to the board yeah, to have people who set these kinds of policies. And to do that, they have to understand things. The people at the top of an organisation should have a wide range of skills. If you want to talk about how the finance is going to work, you probably want people on the board that understand how to read a balance sheet or a profit and loss account. If you want people who are going to be setting policies on how you trade with other countries, you probably want people with international experience or IT experience or HR experience or whatever it happens to be. And weirdly, one of the things about a board is they are not there completely to serve the company. In fact, it's really important that anybody who serves on a board is independent. It's important that anybody on a board can say, hang on, stop. This probably isn't the right thing to do here. Because part of the reason that you have a board is to ensure that you conform to the best practices, you do the right thing. And anybody who's compromised in that way, if, for example, you get somebody on the board whose only reason for being there is that they get paid 300 quid a day to turn up, that's the wrong person. Because their focus is not getting thrown off the board. When in fact, what you want for somebody on a board is to say, hang on, I want to look at this, you need to have a, a critical friend on the board, someone who wants the organisation to succeed but is not afraid to criticise what's going on. That's the same for all organisations. For a government, for example, the board is possibly a cabinet. In this case, the, the UK cabinet is in effect the board of the government. And like I say, you want people with skills, you want people to understand things. For those of you who haven't come across him, Dominic Raab was appointed as a foreign secretary. He didn't appear to understand. That we want a bespoke a arrangement on goods which recognises the peculiar, frankly, geographic economic entity that is the United Kingdom. We are, and I haven't quite understood the full extent of this, but if you look at the UK and you look at how we trade in goods, we're particularly reliant on the Dover-Calais crossing. And that's one of the reasons why, and there's been a lot of controversy about this, but one of the reasons why we've wanted to make sure that we have a specific and very proximate relationship with the EU to ensure frictionless trade at the border. So just to recap, the person who was appointed presumably for his skills to the UK cabinet at Westminster as the foreign secretary, didn't understand that Britain was an island and that trade had to take place over water. And that's what I mean, you need people with skills, you need people who actually understand what's going on, not people who have been appointed because they're a friend or they went to the same school or they've gone to the same clubs. So board members need to be, need to have skill, they need to be independent, and there should be a range of skills. So clearly not everybody can be an expert in everything. But when you create a board, you want people with a range of skills so that everybody knows about something. So as a board, you know about everything. 
So your community development trust want people on there who know about IT or HR or finance or whatever it happens to be. Because apart from anything else, if management come to the board and say, we are going to do X, there should be people on the board who have enough knowledge and experience to say, is that the best way to do it? If so, why? Wouldn't it cause this problem? Wouldn't you have these issues? So the board are there to set policy, but also to challenge how things are working within the organisation. And clearly that includes having high ethical standards. You want board members who will serve the organisation before themselves. If you have a board member who has gained their skills in IT from running an IT company, that's great. But if the board for the organisation in which that person serves needs IT equipment and they just happen to go to the company owned by the IT person on the board because the IT person on the board has recommended it, there's a conflict of interest. I mentioned it last week, it would be like people in the UK government giving lots of contracts to a whole bunch of people who had donated money to the UK government. It wouldn't be right. So there have to be a high standard of skills, high standard of ethics, and everything should be transparent. People should know what's going on. If there is a conflict of interest, so say, for example, that same IT person, the organisation was up to procure some IT and that person's organisation was in for it. There's no reason they can't bid for a contract, say, but there's no way that person should be involved. They should declare a conflict of interest. They should say exactly what that conflict of interest is, say why they'll not take any uh, part in the decision making and actually they should just leave the room whenever anything like that is being talked about. So there's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of skills and a whole uh, set of thresholds that board members have to reach. And I can give you an example. So what I'm giving you is uh, an ad here for non-executive directors, in this case, in the Highlands and Islands airports. Now, this is owned by the government and actually a lot of the um, documents and examples that I'm giving you come from the public sector. There's a few reasons for that. One, I'm fairly familiar with them. So it's easier for me. Uh, two, most public sector organisations have to follow the rules because there's legislation laid out about how they work and what you have to do, which means that they kind of follow best practice. So when I'm showing it to you, I can tell you what organisations should do. Because of course, not all organisations do follow best practice or do the right thing. And the third reason is actually a more practical one. A lot of private sector organisations don't publish these types of documents. So whereas public organisations have to because they are public and they have to uh, be transparent in what they're doing, private organisations often don't have that requirement. So if you look on Moodle, you'll see no more than half a dozen documents that have managed to find from private organisations simply because they keep them internally. Why tell your why tell your competitors 
how you are working. So this is another one that's from the public sector. And they're looking for people to serve on the board of this organization. First thing to note is that actually it is. Well, actually, do you know what this is? Do you know what the LTD actually means in this case? In all cases. Pretty sure it stands for limited, but other than that, no. It does stand for limited. Anybody take that on? You get two different types of organization, <clears throat> two different types of company. Actually, you get a few different types. You've got uh, sole ownerships, partnerships, but you also have companies where you actually have a, a legal organization. And there's two types. There's a private limited company where um, they use the letters LTD. So it just means it's a company. The company has a legal standing and it has to do certain things like turn in accounts at the end of the year. But the shares in that company are private. So you can sell them, but there's no market in them. Or you have PLCs, a public limited company. Same idea, the organisation is a legal entity. It still has things that it has to do, like show its financial results, but the shares in it are publicly traded. So you could walk out tomorrow and buy a share in British Telecom because it's a publicly traded company. You couldn't buy a share in Highlands and Islands airports because it's a private limited company. So LTD means it's a private limited company. In this particular case, <clears throat> excuse me, the voice is going today. In this particular case, it's a private company, but it's wholly owned by the government. So it's set up as a company, but the shareholder is actually the government and by extension us. So that's why even though it's a private company, we can get access to some of its stuff because it's owned by the government. So not surprisingly, if you want to be appointed to the board, you need to provide leadership. You're at the top, you're supposed to show leadership to everyone in the organisation. That should be a given, but it isn't always. But it's just within that framework. So we spoke earlier about setting up a framework explicit and implicit contracts. So that's the framework that exists and you have to provide leadership. Somebody's alarm going off. Leadership within that framework. And you have to set values and standards. Remember, this is verbatim from this advert. And if we look back to our pyramid, we have said a board sets strategy and direction. The ad talks about values and standards. And it talks about stakeholders. It's shareholder, singular, because it's all owned by the Scottish Government, communities and others. OK, so you have to take into account their needs. So it's not just about the organisation itself. It's about the relationships that it has. Set the strategic aims, but taking into account the wider 
Um, I've forgotten the word. It must be a Monday morning thing. Taking into account everything that affects that strategy, including the Scottish Government's national performance framework, because of course it's owned by the government, so you have to take account of government rules. And make sure that it's run properly. The fancy phrases, um, the necessary financial and human resources. Do you have money and do you have people to do this? And it continues. You have to meet your, organ your organization's aims. And actually there's a framework for that, so you have to understand what the organization's aims are. You have to contribute. And again, that's coming back to making sure that the, the board aren't just there because they get money for turning up or it looks good in their CV. They should actually be there, they should actually understand what's going on, they should actually contribute. So they have to prepare for the meetings, they have to read the the documents that are there, they have to understand them and they have to be able to challenge them. And that includes getting information beforehand or talking about them um, during those meetings. They also have to be prepared to talk about those outside of the organisation. So attend meetings with other organisations or seminars, whatever it happens to be. And provide active support. So again, you can't provide support if you don't have any skills. So the people that are appointed to these things should have skills that enable them to do that. And it's not done there. You go into an organisation that has plans, that has a framework, but they are not static. So you have to contribute to any changes that need to be made either from changes in legislation or for changes in finance or changes that happen in any day-to-day -day organization. In this case, maybe an airline decides that they're not going to fly from your airport anymore. What do you do? You'll also have legal ob obligations. So for example, one of the legal obligations that a member of a board for a private limited company has is to approve the finances and say that that is a, a fair rendering of how the organisation is. And again, we spoke about this last week as well. Anybody who's been involved in any organisation will have come across that. Your local sports club will have yearly finances. And it's not just the person who takes charge of the finances that will look at that. Most organisations will have an internal auditor just to go through them and just say, ah, yeah, that looks OK. And then the board is responsible for approving those in the end. And legally responsible. So there are potential penalties if you get it wrong or you approve something you know to be incorrect. Which is why it's a good idea to monitor the financial position as you go along. So there's a whole pile of things that you should be doing as a board. Anybody, any questions on that before we move on? No. Nah, not really. OK, so again, if you remember back to the pyramid, we had the board at the top setting a governance and a strategy. And then we had people who are going to implement that. It's actually best practice for anyone on the board not to be involved in implementing the strategy. That's someone else's job. And there should be that clear delineation. And I don't know if you remember that from the video that I showed you earlier. Somebody should set the strategy, set the goal, and someone else should be involved 
in implementing that. That way you get a, a proper uh, overview of whether it's right goal, whether it can be reached, and you get people who will actually give a, a proper assessment of what's involved. And of course, that means that there's going to be information. You set a strategy that you want sales to increase by 10% per year. Well, you want information back to see how well sales are increasing. Probably not once a year, because if you get to the end of the year and sales haven't increased by 10%, there's very little you can do about it. You'll want reports, say, every month or every quarter. And if you're seeing that every month sales are increasing by 1%, you'll think, right, fine, we're on target. We're going to make that. But if as the months go on, sales don't increase, you might have to say, OK, well, what are we doing wrong? Why aren't we reaching this target? What's the problem with, set, with um, sales? Why aren't we reaching our 10%? Was it a decent target in the first place? You'll quite often see uh, boards that are inexperienced or boards that um, don't really understand what they're doing. Or simply boards that are under pressure, setting targets that are entirely unrealistic. So saying we want to increase sales by 10% over a year seems reasonable. There should be things that we can do to increase sales. Setting a target that says we will increase sales by 200% seems less achievable. And you would have to ask questions of a board that set those kinds of targets. But once the targets have been set, once the schedules have been set, you need to get proper reporting on them and so people on the board must have proper reports and proper corporate information. Some organisations take that to uh, another level and they have real time information. They're quite often called dashboards. And part of the reason I bring them up here is because we are the ones that are involved in setting them up. You can't have real time information if you don't have real time data. And real time data means there's a computer involved somewhere. So quite often we are the people that are left to set up these types of, of system to allow proper management information. So there must be information and it must be formalised. That must happen all the time. And part of that will include risks. We have said that we are going to increase sales by 10%. To increase sales by 10%, we must have 10% more shops. If we open 10% more shops, we need more staff to run them. So on our risk report, we'll say things like cost of opening the shop, cost of uh, recruiting and training staff, possibility that they'll not be very good, possibility that we'll spend all this money and not make our 10% increase in sales. So there has to be proper understanding of what the aims are and how close you are to getting them, which is why you'll sometimes see not governance risk and compliance, but governance risk and control because for a lot of organisations, it's not about legislative compliance, although those, those organisations should look to themselves and remember that compliance is not only important, it's, it's legally required. So more organisations won't change C to compliance, but they'll add in an extra C for control. They'll check to see what sales are like at the moment. They'll check to see what um, what staff attendance is like, how many people have turned up that day. Any of you who have ever worked in a call centre will know that there's big screens put up there. What is our 
current time to answer a call? What is our current average call length? How many people have hung up before we've answered the phone? All that kind of stuff. And if it takes more than 30 seconds to answer a call, that's a control. At which point somebody will get a, a ping on the screen to say it's now 35 seconds before the calls are answered. Do something about it. And again, these kinds of systems can't be implemented without computers, without us. So what you get is something that sounds like an awful lot of work. Because it is. It's a truism. You don't get anything good without working at it, and it's the same for an organisation. It may be a lot easier to ignore all these kinds of things, but actually, if you put them in place, what you'll have is a better organisation, a more stable organisation, and an organisation that's better able to continue in the long term. Because it understands, excuse me, what needs to happen for the organisation to thrive. You might say, oh, well, somebody doesn't answer the phone in 30 seconds, who cares? Well, the person whose call's not been answered cares. And your reputation can go if you don't answer that call. All of these things matter to the bottom line because you want people to trust you, whether it's your customers, your suppliers, your own staff. You want there to be trust. Because if you have trust, it makes it so much easier to do business or do charity or do whatever your organisation is. So it is a good thing to do and it is good for the organisation, but of course, not everyone sees it that way. We talked last week about an organisation who didn't put in proper governance structures. They allowed one person to be responsible for all the finance. Sadly, that's not an isolated case. I've put links there in the slides to a whole bunch of organisations who didn't follow these types of a uh, rule. So, for example, you had Enron. who are an energy company. And Enron would do things like stop supplying power. Which sounds counterintuitive for a power company. But actually what they worked out was if they stopped supplying power. The organisations that they dealt with had to buy power from a different company at a higher price, which as it happened, they owned as well. So they would stop buying, they would stop selling electricity a penny, a unit or whatever the number was. So that they would have to go to a different organisation that would sell it at 10 pence a unit. Not only was that ethically terrible, it was illegal. And like I said, when you have an organisation and you have financial instruments that you have to turn in, you quite often have an auditor. Now, if you're a local sports club, it's probably just somebody else that's in the, the sports club. For a publicly traded company, you actually need to employ accountants to do that. Enron's accountants were Arthur Anderson. And Arthur Anderson didn't do their job. Arthur Anderson said, yeah, OK. Why? Because Enron were paying them tons and tons of money. And they wanted to be kept paying you know, tons and tons of money. So they didn't want to say, no, you're not allowed to do this. They just simply said, OK, where's my money? But of course, these things are a habit of catching up on you. You can read about Enron there. They were caught up on. 
people were jailed. Enron went bust and actually Arthur Anderson, who were one of the three biggest accounting companies in the world, collapsed. They collapsed partly because of lawsuits, because they hadn't done their due diligence and hadn't actually audited their accounts. But they also collapsed because the other organisations that Arthur Anderson were dealing with pulled their business. Because of course, if you put out your accounts and it says, yes, these have been signed off by Arthur Anderson, what, the same Arthur Anderson that signed off Enron's accounts and didn't notice all that big fraud? Yeah, yeah, that Arthur Anderson. That is not good for your organisation. So Arthur Anderson went bust. All of these things fit in with each other. And as I say, you can you can click in some of those links from the slides. Some countries took this more seriously than others. So quite often you'll see in a lot of the the documents that we're going to look at reference to some to something called the Sarbanes Oxley Act. Uh, there are two US senators, and this was an act that was brought in in America to tighten up the financial controls for organizations. Most countries have similar things. Third world countries don't have legislation, they have a code because, you know, they're all gentlemen, they all went to Eton, and of course none of them would do anything nasty. So instead of having something like the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, the UK has the UK Corporate Governance Code. Things that you're supposed to do, things that a gentleman would do. But you know, we don't need to actually put that into legislation because, of course, gentlemen would never, ever break the code. Except, of course, you saw last week with the patisserie Valerie example that they absolutely do. So there's a link to this on Moodle and it'll give you an idea of... what the code is in the UK and how they suggest that boards should be set up and how proper corporate governance should take place. And that happens in all sorts of places. Um, There's a UK stewardship code, same kind of idea, how you should look after an organisation. In the public sector, there are things like a scheme of administration. It uses the idea that not everybody, you know, you can't do everything in an organisation. So you might want to split up what's going on. You might want some people to be responsible for some things and some people to be responsible for others. If you have people on the board who are adept at IT, maybe you want an IT subcommittee or a finance subcommittee. Sorry, this is just so slow. I think my video is slowing down as well. Is it just my 
cider is really jerky. That's quite jerky. Wonder if my daughter's got a lecture. She's maybe sucking the bandwidth now. So should this ever come up, what it will show you is a, a scheme of um, delegation. Who gets to decide what? It doesn't want to come up, so you can go and look at these. I'll try and prepare them later and download them, but it's just going so slowly. So things that you'll administer. So who on the board is responsible for what particular things? What do you then delegate to the management? Which in council speak is an officer. And you have the same sort of thing in the IJB. So you remember those triangles and I showed you a government and I showed you a, an IJB. They have the same sort of thing. So for example, on this uh, scheme of delegation, if you want to spend a million pounds on something, the board have to approve it. If you want to spend a pound on paper clips, you let your staff approve it. So the question then becomes, where does it stop being something that you delegate to staff and something that you want to make the decision on yourself? So things like that are laid out in these documents. What is the extent of the decision making power that you get? Is it a million pounds or is it one pound? And do different people get different amounts? No, probably. Really does not want to open. I don't know if it's Moodle. My computer, my broadband. Just pretending it's going to go get it, but it's not going to. No, it's getting there. OK, you can look at these yourself once we're done here. I'll leave that and see if it's going to come up. Oh, finally getting something. It's just so slow. One thing you might want to notice is for this council, the document, and this is just a document that says who gets to decide what, is 79 pages long. So they've gone into a lot of detail. Who does what? Who gets to do particular things with particular stuff? Head of service gets 11 pages. An executive director for the economy gets 19 pages. Education weirdly only gets five. So depending on what it is they're doing, there'll be different things in there. It says how they can be changed. What happens if somebody's not there? What if somebody's on holiday? Does the authority go down? Does it go up? What's the general idea in terms of delegating decision making or delegating powers? OK, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that just says how all these, these things will work. And all good organisations should have them in there. So 
like I said, I'm going to just pass on waiting to see if these come down. They're so slow. So you can have a look at these and um, they'll give you an idea of how that organisation works. Actually, there's two organisations, there's the council and there's the IJB. There's also this thing here. Which I've taken the precaution of downloading before the lecture started. Because it's a really big document. And it comes from an organisation called OCEG. And it talks about all of this governance, risk and compliance and how it should work. So what you've got there is basically uh, a framework for how this organisation think it should all fit together. So slow. I give up, even though it's downloaded it, it's I don't know what it's doing. I don't know why it doesn't want to render it. OK, we shall leave that. You can again have a look at that. Any questions about what we've been doing today? No. Nope. Nothing is yet. OK, so. I mentioned last week that we'd split the time, so there'll be a lecture part and this is now moving into the tutorial part. Oh man, so slow. So you'll have a quiz here. You won't be able to answer everything in it just now because clearly we've not finished this section. We'll finish this off next week. But have a go at the questions that you can. And also, I want you to have a look at this stuff. So have a look at the governance for this organisation. So if you go to the UWS website, there will be documents on governance. And to give you a hint, what you should be looking for in particular are things that talk about Senate, things that talk about court, and things that talk about executives. It'll give you an idea of how the governance is set up for this organisation, which hopefully is one that you're familiar with. Like I say, this goes on till three o'clock. I will be here. Cup of tea making it accepted. So I'll be here if you want any questions, if you have anything that you want to ask. I will be around. So last week I kept open this team. I won't do that this time. Instead, I'll have teams open. So if you want to grab me, either chat on teams or start a, a, a video call on teams or whatever. But use teams to catch my attention. So I'll have teams open. And if you need me, I will keep an eye on it. OK. Those might be helpful for anything you're doing. So are there any questions? Not yet. 
No, not for me. Now remember what I said, the tutorials, the quiz questions, they're not just about doing the tutorial and the quiz. The idea is you will then use them to feed straight into your document. So this is the way of building up your assessment over the next few weeks so that you're not getting to week 10 and going, oh, I better start writing the first of my 70 pages. Build this stuff up as we're doing it, as it's fresh in your mind. So that when you get to the end, what you're doing is just pulling it all together. OK, I'm going to stop the recording there. I'm going to very slowly stop the recording there. This is why I'm not leaving Teams on. Teams is currently taking 74% of my CPU and 48% of my memory.